you now. My job is, I'm a medical oncologist, but a long time ago now, about 12 years ago, we developed a screening and prevention program here at NYU, at NYU and Bellevue. And we did that because finally, you know, I was taking care of patients with cancer for years and years and years, day in and day out. Finally, the science began to catch up with our clinical practice, and there's now something we can actually do to identify patients who are at higher risk for developing some of these cancers, understand your risk, once you understand it, be able to do something about it, and actually intervene in a meaningful way for survival. Okay, so why is it even important to understand your risk for colorectal? cancer, CRC, colorectal cancer syndromes. Many of these syndromes do run in the family, as you heard from Dr. White. So that key point about trying to figure out your family's history, you know, generations ago, even one generation ago, if you ask people, what did your grandmother die of? What did your mother have for a medical history? Not, people don't know, because in those days, one generation ago, there wasn't much we could do. Now things have really changed, so it's extremely important for you and for the generation subsequent to you to understand what the process was. And so I can't emphasize enough that point. Find out, you know, you ask people what happened to your mother or your father, and they say, their mother, well, it was something here, something here, and, you know, something happened. There are a lot of things here. And it really can make a big difference to know, is it ovarian cancer? Is it stomach cancer? Is it colon cancer? So just try to find these things out if you can. 25% of colorectal cancers, a quarter of colon cancers, are associated with a family history. So that is a very useful piece of information. Uh, I'm not going to talk about some of these very unusual syndromes that are listed, but I put them up just to show you that we now understand the molecular biology and the genetics of many colon cancers and how they're linked to our families because each of our families has unique genetics. But if you take a, anyone who's about 50 years old, their population lifetime risk at, by the time they reach 50 is about 1.8% for developing colorectal cancer. It's tripled almost if they have just one relative who's had colorectal cancer, and it's almost 7% if they have two or more relatives with colorectal cancer. So it helps you understand whether you're at higher risk to know that family history. Now this is a complicated slide, but I just want to go through this with you because this is a colorectal cancer syndrome that runs in the family. It is not uncommon, and we are learning more and more about it. We understand a lot about the biology and the molecular genetics now, and we can prevent these cancers from occurring, and they will occur if you have this mutation, this genetic mutation. They will likely occur in your lifetime we can prevent them if we know. So when I put up on the top non-polyposis, that means, as you heard from Dr. White, it's very common that you have these, um, the, you know, a colonoscopy, and it shows, we've known this for actually decades, that you go to the gastroenterologist, they do a colonoscopy, and they call you up, and they say, oh, your patient has a colon, that is blanketed, carpeted with polyps. So many polyps, we can't even find normal tissue in between, normal. That, we know, we've known that for decades, that's genetic, it's, it's related to a familial polyposis syndrome. You form a ton of polyps, and the risk of colon cancer is extremely high, so we need to identify those patients and protect them. Now, in the last couple of, uh, you know, in the last decade or so, we've come to understand something called non-polyposis because, well, those patients get it, but there are not very many in the population. Why are all these other patients in the population getting colorectal cancer? Some of them, about a fifth of them, are getting it because they have a genetic mutation, and that mutation in that DNA is causing a very high chance they will get it, and it runs in the family. And those are called, but when you look in the colon, you don't see these, 
you know, colons carpeted with polyps, you just see maybe a polyp or a few polyps. That's called non-polyposis hereditary, non-polyposis colorectal cancer syndrome, HNPCC, or Lynch syndrome, Lynch syndrome. So that's a very important syndrome to identify because those patients, as you see here, look on that first line, colorectal cancer, CRC, if they have Lynch syndrome, they will develop, 80% of them will develop colon cancer by the time you're 70, 80% of those patients. We can, we can prevent those cancers. In addition, it's associated with endometrial cancer, EC, endometrial or uterine cancer. Uterine cancer is normally in our population a very unusual cancer. Not so if you have Lynch syndrome. If you have this DNA mutation, then women who would normally have a one or two percent chance, lifetime chance of getting endometrial cancer, they have a 60 percent chance of getting endometrial or uterine cancer by the age of 70. That is a preventable cancer. Okay, so if you know that you or anyone in the family has had early onset colon cancer, because we know that a lot of people get colon cancer, but the sporadic colon cancers that occur in the general population where it's not related to a hereditary familial risk, those cancers, you hear, okay, the, my grandfather got colon cancer when he was in his 70s or 80s. That's not so unusual, but if you hear in your family that someone got a colon cancer younger than what you would normally expect from the sporadic, that could be a tip-off, a clue, that there's something in the genes in that family that predisposes some people, not all, you have to test for it, but some people to a higher risk of colorectal cancer. So if you know that there's someone who in the family who's had colorectal cancer under 60, you need to say to yourself, okay, so why, why did someone in my family get colorectal cancer in their 50s or younger? That's distinctly unusual and may be linked to a gene that gives you a higher chance of getting it. Same with endometrial cancer. As I said, it's a rare cancer. It's particularly rare in premenopausal women, women who are still menstruating. After menopause, it's not quite as uncommon. It rises in incidence. So if there's someone in your family who had uterine cancer, endometrial cancer, under 50, which is a sort of general cutoff for menopause, think about this because you could save your life and your family's lives. These on the bottom are the other cancers that have a high incidence of occurring in this Lynch syndrome. And the two I really want to mention most, because they have the highest, uh, are the gastric, stomach, and ovarian. And then renal is next. Those three cancers all have in the teens incidence of occurring, whereas they're in the under 5%, well under 5% in the general population. So two, three times, four times the incidence in a patient who has this genetic syndrome and doesn't know it. If you pick it up, you can prevent those cancers uh, by screening guidelines, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. I just wanted to put up the, this in case you ever hear of anyone that you know of getting those, those um, diagnoses of polyposis syndromes. They are familial adenomatous polyposis, FAP, and AFAP, attenuated familial adenomatous polyposis. There's a new one that's been described, MYH, but I'm not gonna talk about that much because not much is, as much is known about the genetics. But we know very clearly the genetics of the familial and the attenuated familial adenomatous polyposis syndromes. We know how to identify people who are affected with it, and we definitely know how to protect them. So if anyone you know goes to for uh, any reason, for symptoms or for general screening to a gastroenterologist and they're told we have lots of polyps, tell them they've got to get genetic testing to see if they have this syndrome because it can save their lives. Now, as a medical oncologist, this is actually one of the ways I got interested in this field of prevention. 
in addition to the science, was that you know, people would come to me with a colon cancer. In the old days, meaning 10 years ago, <laughs> you know, there wasn't a whole lot compared to now that we could do for colon cancer. And this has happened in a number of cancers. Breast cancer was the first that we truly extended survival. But colorectal cancer now, we can make enormous, and we have made enormous strides in the treatment. So now, if someone comes in and has colorectal cancer, if we treat that cancer and they, we expect them to survive our treatment and the cancer, which we now do in many cases, then we have to think to ourselves for the first time, okay, now this person's gonna live through this cancer. What's gonna happen in the next five, 10, 15, 20, 25 years of their life? And now that we've identified these associated syndromes, we know that some of these patients will have a higher chance of getting another associated cancer, the ones that could have been prevented. So 15 years ago, when we were treating colorectal cancer as oncologists, all we wanted to do was get them through that, that initial diagnosis and treatment. So we'd do the best we could and we'd cross our fingers and hope that they would make it. And some did fine and lived and others no, and many no. Now the situations change. So we expect many people to survive the diagnosis of colon cancer. We've got to see what's gonna to happen to them down the road so that we can prevent a problem. Because if we find out later when they come in with that second, third, fourth cancer that they now have a cancer that we can't prevent or cure, but if we had known it because we had thought of the genetics initially with their diagnosis, picked it up and intervened, then we could have prevented that cancer, okay? This is, the, this is like if you go into all the medical literature and you look at the risk of getting a second cancer. Supposing someone has this Lynch syndrome, their risk is, you can see, 50% within the next 15 years after the diagnosis of their first cancer. 50% of those patients in 15 years will have at least one more cancer. So those patients' lives we could hope to save. With familial adenomatous polyposis, this is the risk of the second cancers after diagnosis. And the risk is not so high, uh, so I'm not gonna go through those, but the main thing I would say to you is this last line on this slide. If you know of someone or you find that there is a familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome, carpeted, blanketing, polyps, the important thing is to tell them that when they have children, they need to tell the pediatrician because there is an increased incidence in that population of the children in the first five years of their life developing a very uh, aggressive liver cancer, hepatoblastoma, and that can be screened for if the pediatrician knows, looking carefully at the liver and at blood tests for the first five years of the child's life. Uh, this is just to give you a picture, a graph that's a picture of uh, the difference in your risk of getting uh, cancers if you have this familial syndrome versus if you're, you don't have it. And the light, light blue uh, is uh, just the normal population and the dark gray is the Lynch population. You can see you have a much, much higher chance within 10 years on the left and 15 years on the right. And this is the risk of an endometrial. Remember, endometrial, uterine cancer, really rare in the general population. See, you can hardly see the blue uh, in a group that doesn't have Lynch syndrome, but really high if they have this mutation. And that is a truly preventable cancer and a preventable death. So this is what our organization, the main umbrella cancer organization called the NCCN, that network, National Cancer Network, tells us is how you should screen these patients who are at high risk. Very different than the person at average risk. The, if you find someone who has this high risk, they have to start colonoscopies at age 20 
to 25 and have them every one to two years. I don't advise them to wait for the full two years. The biology of these colon cancers is very different than the biology of a sporadic colon cancer. They grow very quickly and I ask every, all my patients to be screened every one to one and a half years. And that way I have found many cancers that would have been advanced but if we went by the general screening guidelines and they can be uh, eradicated. So after the age of 40, everyone agrees uh, screening every single year with colonoscopy. Because with Lynch syndrome, as I was telling you, there is the ovarian risk and the high endometrial risk, they need to be screened. The women need to be screened for ovarian and endometrial cancer very aggressively. So uh, endometrial aspiration, which is an office procedure, transvaginal ultrasound, and a blood test, CA-125, starting at the age of 25 to 35 every single year, okay? This is just to show you the guidelines for if you find someone who has a familial polyposis, adenomatous polyposis syndrome, you have to be very aggressive with them because these patients in every study we have, the patients with familial polyposis syndromes have a 90, somewhere between a 98 or, or a 99 and 100% chance, lifetime chance of getting colorectal cancer. So you must be very aggressive. Start their screening early because there is a propensity in this genetic mutation for the lowest part, the rectum, you have to start sigmoidoscopies when they're children at 10 to 12 years old, sigmoidoscopies. And then you have to lo start looking at the rest of the colon with colonoscopies, whether, regardless of what syndrome they have in the polyposis spectrum when they hit um, their teenage years or early 20s with colonoscopies every one to three years. And they should have their stomach looked at as well with upper endoscopy. Uh, this I'm not going to spend much time on because Dr. White went over most of this. I just want to tell you from the, from the prevention point of view, I like everything she said and I would go with all of it. Just keep in mind that we need more chemo prevention and don't rely on um, what we have right now. Yes, a healthy lifestyle, yes, diet and exercise, certainly cigarette smoking and decrease animal fats, but just keep in mind that when you take a look in the medical literature at the preponderance of data, there is no proof, all these things you hear about aspirin, non-steroidals like um, ibuprofen and drugs like that, uh, oral contraceptives, there's no absolute proof yet that any of these prevent colorectal cancer. There is some proof, but it's not solving the problem in terms of lifestyle modifiers, weight control, cigarettes, healthy diet, and exercise. I couldn't advise this more strongly because remember that that, that group of people who are at risk for colon cancer is, you know, we're talking about us, people in, who are hitting 50 and above in the United States. And in fact, as much as we worry about things like cancer, what most of us die of in this country is heart disease. So stick to this kind of life. These are things you can do. You can't do anything about your genetics. You can do a lot about relative risk factors and lifestyle modifiers. So try to do it and don't feel that you have to do all of this at once. Move towards it because every step moving towards it gets you on the right path. And then um, we, we uh, have no protective, just so you know, there's no protective effect of any of the over-the-counter supplements that have been touted or uh, oral calcium. There are a lot of studies ongoing with uh, supplements, but we don't have the solid data yet. So I would say be aware of your risk, try to understand what your risk level is, and then appropriate surveillance and prevention. Thank you very much.